All right, we are live. This is Dr. Mounts. Welcome to All Things Unexplained. We cover everything from aliens to Bigfoot to astrophysics. We're a top 25 science charts podcast. We've been nominated for a People's Choice Award. Probably would be a top 25 paranormal podcast, but that's not a category, I don't think. So if that's your thing, if you're into Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, follow us on social media. You're going to be seeing it scroll across the bottom of your screen tonight. Also, follow us wherever you podcast. Shout out to Blake Best tonight. Amazing composer, actor, author, Tony man. For our little music here at the beginning tonight called Monsters in the Woods, you can find him on YouTube. Some quick announcements this month coming to All Things Unexplained. We've got Avi Loeb coming on in April. He's going to be here to talk about his new draft paper with the head of NASA, where they say that there could be a alien mothership sending drones down to Earth. He'll also be talking about his privately funded expedition to look for extraterrestrial objects in the bottom of the ocean. And later this month, we'll have the most famous alien abductee of all time on with us. Travis Walton, you know him from Fire in the Sky, he'll be on with us at the end of this month. And before we go any further, I hear, before I kick it to Larry, I hear a little bit of feedback. Does anybody else hear that? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing it. Uh, Eric, I'm wondering, do you happen to have any headphones that might be coming through your speakers? I don't, but I might be able to to take the sound levels in my space here down just a little bit. Let me know if that helps at all. Testing okay. one, two, three, we're live, but I think that helped. I don't, I just still hear a little bit of feedback, but it doesn't seem to be quite as bad. I do think it's coming from Eric's end and that, that seems a lot better to me. So again, welcome to All Things Unexplained tonight. And now here all the way from California, Live and in person for the first time ever. No one has ever seen his face until tonight. It is the one and only Larry. All Things Unexplained. Hosted by Dr. Mounts, CJ Derringer, and Smitty Neves. Hooray! <laughs> that was great. Thanks, and now we're going to kick it straight to a special sneak preview of season four of the secret of skinwalker ranch the closer that we are getting to the answers the more covert military activity continues what is the military doing flying over skinwalker ranch someone's taking an interest in what we're doing somebody's up on the ridge right there this is the largest scale experiment that we've ever done here so far. Fire! There's something in the sky. The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch. New season, Tuesday, April 18th at 10 on the History Channel. Well, if that doesn't get you excited about this episode of All Things Explained or this season of the Skinwalker Ranch, I'm just not sure what will. Oh my gosh, I'm hooked. I've lost sleep <laughs> watching the episodes lately. You guys have me literally thinking all different possibilities. We're talking orbs today. We're talking UFOs. We're talking about the history of Native American land, about land that's been owned by so many different people and what is happening there. We've got people getting sick every time the land is touched. We've got animal mutilations. I mean, we have it all coming at you. And we have special guests joining us tonight. We could not be more thankful to have Eric Bard and Thomas Winterton with us from the Secret of Skin Walker Ranch from the History Channel. Welcome. Thank you. We Great are so you. thankful. Thanks for having me on. Yes, we've got lots of people chiming into the show already. If anybody has questions for us or for our guests, please go ahead and chime in. We will do our best to get to some towards the end of the show. And just a quick little background on our two guests today. Eric Bard is the principal investigator as well as the chief scientist at Skinwalker Ranch. And Thomas Winterton is the superintendent of the ranch. And if you've seen the show, you have seen their faces many, many times. And Eric, I have to say, you're, I think, wearing the same outfit. 
that you wear on the show. And I'm so excited by that. <laughs> I, I hate, I don't know if I should admit this, Tom, should I tell him? This right. is all I've got. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I wear every day. Awesome. Well, I was half expecting to see Tom's cowboy hat too. It's just so iconic for, for who you are on this show, but i um, very happy to have you guys here. We're going to dive right into it. We want to be respectful of your time. And for those that have not seen the show before, can you guys tell us just a little bit about the history and mystery of Skinwalker Ranch? So Thomas, do you want to jump in on that one or would you like me to start? Go ahead and start off. Well, you know, for, for those who aren't familiar with the, the narrative, obviously we're at a location that is known for a lot of um, very unusual activity. We call it anomalous. We don't like to use the word, but some people uh, have termed it paranormal. We are talking about uh, some of the things that you mentioned earlier uh, and everything from UAP, UFO phenomena, as well as, um, frankly, everything in the book, portals, orbs, uh, cryptids, meaning non-conforming biological entities. Um, you know, we're still exploring a whole lot of different things that are taking place here that affect our, our, our measurements. We can see them in our cameras. We can see them uh, affecting our, our instruments as well as ourselves, you know, physically. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely a place with many mysteries. Yeah, it sure seems to be. What initially drew you, let, I'll start with you, Tom. What drew you to the ranch and were you working there before the show? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I was in high school at the height of the Bigelow uh, era there in the late 90s uh, when a lot of the strange occurrences were taking place. And and I remember going out there, taking our dates out to the gate and doing exactly <laughs> what we tell people not to do. And that was jumping the gate and, you know, walking in. Now, we only made it in maybe 50 or 100 feet before our dates were scared and, and clinging on tight. And that was the goal anyway. So then we'd head back uh, to the trucks. But um, I really, I, I really didn't follow it that closely. Um, I'd heard the rumors around town and, and read the newspaper articles in the local paper, but I actually wasn't associated with it until Brandon purchased the ranch. And the, the first week that he purchased it, he sent uh, his close confidant, uh, Jim Morse out. And you probably see Jim on the show with the, yeah. with the wire and the Pendleton vest. Yeah. So Jim, uh, Brandon sent Jim out to figure out what the heck he just purchased and, and what start to figure out a game plan of what to do with it. And Jim actually rolled into Roosevelt. And at the time my wife and I owned a couple of small uh, motels. One of them happened to be there in Roosevelt and Jim uh, pulled in on that Sunday and, and I uh, checked him in to his room. And the next day when he got, when uh, he went to leave, we got visiting and he found out I was a licensed contractor. And, and he said, you know, uh, I'm out here representing a guy. I can't tell you who he is, but uh, we, he just purchased Skinwalker Ranch. Have you ever heard of it? And I said, yeah, I've, I've heard of it. Um, and he said, well, if, if you're a general contractor, would you mind, because uh, I was a licensed general contractor uh, and in the state of Utah. And so Jim asked me if I would come out and do a property inspection for him and inspect the facilities. And so the following week was my first time of, of going on to the ranch. And, uh, and that's how I became associated with it. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of major issues uh, that, that I discovered when I was doing the inspection that needed uh, immediate attention. So I helped Brandon and Jim correct those and get those taken care of. And Brandon, uh, where I lived there in Roosevelt, Brandon just asked me if I'd stay on and run the ranch for him. And I've been there ever since. So. Okay. So you're local. You're a local yokel there. That's cool. And then how about you, Eric, your background, my goodness, we could spend an entire show just going over your background and in the sciences and astrophysics and such, but how did you get brought into this group? You know, I remember the first time I, I heard about um, Brandon's intent to purchase the ranch and, you know, he sent me uh, uh, an excited text message talking about the possibility of acquiring the property and his, uh, his proposition was, how would you like to, to go out and, and uh, do some very speculative exploratory science, you know, on this, on this sprawling uh, uh, 
ranch out here in, in, in northeastern Utah, and, and, I, and I asked him a little bit more about what, what it was all about. After I got a response from him, I said, you first. <laughs> in other words, I, you know, I, was, I, I wasn't an immediate taker at all. And in fact, I remember that even after Brandon acquired the property, um, you know, I, I, I probably turned down four or five invitations, politely, of course, uh, to visit because I just I couldn't imagine what, what what could I do here. Yeah. Has this become your full time job now? <laughs> well, at least uh, in, in recent times, I guess you could say it, it has been. You know, I have some other activities that I'm participating in, you know, some other commercial activities. But, uh, yeah, you know, obviously I've got a, a lot of uh, boots on the ground time out here. Okay. Very cool. So how now that you've been there, have your perceptions changed? So it sounds like neither of you really were that interested. You weren't asking to go there. You were asked to go there. How have your perceptions changed since you started? Wow. Um, well, so I went on as a pretty healthy skeptic. Um, you know, I, I haven't followed the paranormal space. I wasn't involved in that. Um, and, uh, and I went on thinking that there was a whole bunch of hyped stories, uh, probably greatly exaggerated. And I didn't, I didn't put a lot of stock into it. And, um, it took me a while. I mean, you know, right my very first time on the ranch, I had my first experience as far as feeling abnormal, feeling out of sorts. Uh, I was in the ranch house and we were back there doing an inspection and it felt like the room literally felt like it started to spin and I started to feel mm -hmm. nauseous and some vertigo to the point that I had to back up against the wall and slide down, sit on the floor. I chalked it up as, you know, I must have got low blood sugar or, or you know, lightheaded, something like that. But looking back, you know, that hadn't happened before to me and it hasn't happened anywhere else besides the ranch. So, um, but I went a year or maybe longer uh, before I finally was to the point that I, I, I felt more foolish trying to explain it away with rational mundane logic than I did just finally accepting the fact that there's things happening there that we just don't understand at this point. So, I, you know, my, my world's kind of flipped upside down in the past seven years. I, I, I live in a different world today than I did back in, in 2016 when I first went on it. Yeah, I feel that same way having done this podcast, to be honest, like an awakening almost <laughs> truly. And how about yourself, Eric? You know, I think um, the bar was set at the time of my first visit. You know, I had attended a meeting uh, on Brandon's invitation with some of the folks who were involved previously with the NIDS and Bass era research. Um, you could say that the things that they shared piqued my interest, but they hardly uh, you know, provided a payload of, of, of what we would call data. There was nothing uh, compelling, just very interesting in what was shared with me. So when I finally came out, which would have been in October, I believe it was the, uh, the 14th of October in 2016, I came out with a group of, of uh, I want to say it was 11 individuals uh, on site. And immediately, uh, some very unusual things started happening. Um, um, didn't really have a bin. I didn't have a box in my mind, if you will, to put to put these things in. I got, you know, I, I think I've related in other in other venues. I've I've shared uh, some things that have happened with the devices that I carried. I had a phone that was misbehaving when I went to the top of the mesa, got myself away from other people, and saw this this misbehavior of this device like I'd never seen before. Got out to the homestead, and it's interesting, you know, what Thomas has described the the sense of uh, low blood sugar, you know, being you know, this, this vertigo sensation, I, you know, there were several people who experienced that at the same time, again, attended by a malfunction. I could literally see this thing in my hands malfunctioning when uh, uh, I experienced mild vertigo, but others were talking about really feeling like their blood sugar had plummeted. And, uh, you know, that day was just, as I said, very eventful. We had someone who was uh, very adversely medically affected, we think, by his uh, visit to the ranch. Uh, basically lost consciousness for about 10 minutes um, and ended up being, um, as I said, adversely affected medically for a period of about three, three and a half weeks. Um, one of those mystery diagnosis type of circumstances. I don't think we ever really drilled down to what the medical 
uh, cause was, but it seemed to be something neurological in his case. And then, of course, we have what Brandon has related, uh, you know, a, a, a sighting by uh, Brandon and two other individuals of something, whatever it was, darting around abruptly over the Mesa, um, fitting the description of your classic uh, UFO or UAP. Um, and, you know, he tells the story, obviously, better than I can. Interestingly, I was right there with him and with those other two individuals looking around in the sky, unable to see whatever it was that they were oh. all pointing to in unison. It was such a bizarre experience. Wow. That, yeah, that's wild. There's been so many things on the show that have really just rocked my brain. And you've shown several people getting ill. Tom, you especially. Season one focused a lot on what happened to you when you guys started digging on the show. But that's just the show. You don't think about what else is happening there when the, when the cameras aren't there. And I know Smitty had a question in regards to some of the things that are happening there as well. Yeah, uh, one of the things that, that I noticed, of course, I'm a historian, so I kind of dig into stuff and research. And I, there is a unusually high number of missile launch and testing sites within a five-hour or less radius from Skinwalker Ranch. Do you believe that that has anything to do with possibly the radiation levels at the ranch? You know, the, the strange thing about the radiation here at the ranch is that, um, you know, if we have, if we just have natural radiation that's, that's here in the environment, if it's something, you know, associated with the land, we don't expect to see transients. We don't expect to see, you know, spikes and then, right. and then the disappearance. So you do get a sense that there's a technological signature there. There's something modulating the, the measured radiation, um, but whether that has anything to do with missile launches, you know, your guess is as good as mine. I, I don't find any correlations to, to missile launches. In fact, I'm not aware. I, I don't know that I've seen any of those uh, yeah. uh, from the perspective of the ranch. Well, I just know I've, I've looked, I did some research. Tekoi rocket test range, the Utah launch complex, the Utah test and training range, and Wendover Field are within five hours or less from the Skinwalker Ranch. And I just thought that is a high amount of places that the military has in that particular area. I just, you know, maybe possibly they're doing some testing there. Top secret yeah. things. You would you think know, that that would affect other areas too, though, other areas around it. I know that we've had discussions. You know, another thing is they, they I heard the number that they had tested over a thousand atomic bombs down there at the test range in Nevada and if you look at the air, the jet stream and the air flows from the downwind of where that was at, you know, the ranch is right in the path of that. And we had that discussion, I remember, right at the very beginning. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why we brought Qualtech out mm -hmm. from Idaho and did a very thorough uh, analysis and scan of the ranch. We got a clean bill of health. Yeah. Uh, from them, they didn't pick up anything that was concerning or or out of the ordinary. So, you know, based on the history of of some of that activity that occurred, we did we did bring out experts to to make sure that that wasn't occurring. So this it's originating from some basically unknown location. Is that what you think? Not really. We can't pinpoint exactly what's going on. I think that's super interesting though that it's that you've had those experts come out and they weren't able to identify exactly what's going on. Thanks. Pretty amazing. So I wonder too, there was one episode where I think Dr. Travis Taylor had, oh, you guys opened something and there was a high level of radiation. He actually had some blisters on his skin. And then later that section was tested and the radiation levels weren't very high there anymore. Is that normal? I don't know enough about Radiation, would that be something normal that it would go away? Or have you seen other other instances of that on the ranch? Well, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, if we have if we have uh, radioactive isotopes in the environment, we don't expect to see sudden uh, sudden transient, you know, spikes. We don't right. ex we expect to see a level and to just, uh, you know, see it localized um, and remain more or less constant. Um, and so it is that it is that sudden change that that makes us suspicious that you know this is a technological signature or something else you know maybe some event right. is taking place that is 
accompanied by a burst of radiation. Hmm. Um, and, and you got it right. You know, Travis uh, was uh, examined medically uh, and the, as he has shared, you know, the, the, the diagnosis was that he had been exposed to what we call ionizing radiation, which is, you know, dangerous for our tissues. And then we go back to those locations and we, we measure, you know, nothing elevated over the normal background readings. So indeed, what is responsible for that? That's not natural. Yeah. Well, and if it I wasn't guess. for those physical symptoms, I mean, we've, we've had many conversations that if it wasn't for those accompanying physical symptoms that he, that he experienced along with the medical uh, diagnosis by a third party doctor, uh, I, we'd probably be more inclined to think that it's something electromagnetic or some electromagnetic interference that's actually spoofing the device to make it right. think that it's getting those readings, right? So, yes, yes. T Tom raises a very important point here, and that is we know that even though we, we may be holding an instrument in our hands that is designed to measure, say, gamma rays, it's you know designed to detect a certain type of radiation, there's also the possibility of something that, that uh, Thomas has alluded to called EMI or electromagnetic interference that can spoof or cause a device to register gamma hits uh, when in fact it is just uh, excitation from some RF source. So, you know, yeah, you nailed it, Tom. You know, it's interesting. I, I think it bears mentioning, I, you know, I hope this doesn't get me in any hot water, but I'll, <laughs> I, I want to share something about it. <laughs> I want to share something else that isn't widely known. And that is that uh, when uh, that event happened with Dr. Taylor, uh, uh, a lot of the production equipment was affected. Um, you know, Tom's nodding. So you're in on it, Tom. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, and so uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to say too much, but, but what, what I'll tell you is that the production equipment, meaning cameras and audio and so forth, were also affected uh, at mm. the same time by whatever that event was. Well, and, and I, Eric, I'll just expand on that a little bit more for the audience. And that if I, if I remember correctly, it, it was to the point that the production cameras were not working. And the scene that you're watching on television of, of that uh, unfolding was actually one of the producers had the presence of mind to grab his iPhone and record oh, his iPhone. So the footage that you're seeing on t TV wasn't gotten by the uh production cameras that was filmed yeah. on an iPhone because the production cameras had all been taken offline by whatever it was. That's crazy. That sort of takes us into our next topic here, which is the scientific investigation and the tools that you guys use from the start. And again, I'm, it's so hard because there's the show, right? And then there's the existence of this actual ranch where there are actually things happening and it's hard to make room for both of those. But in the beginning of the show, you guys had a few tech technological devices and now, holy moly, <laughs> you have everything. You're shipping it in from everywhere and having all kinds of people come in. But it does seem like a lot of people lose power or lose signal or what have you whenever you guys go to work you know, on the triangle or different areas of the ranch. How are you maintaining scientific investigation throughout all of your, your different explorations on the ranch? You know, the, um, the, I'll back up to the beginning, you know, our, our, um, instrumented vigil on the property began, you know, in, in a fairly austere way. It was fairly straightforward, simple, nothing over the top. Um, it was actually Thomas who installed the very first surveillance system on the property, you know, and it's your, it's your standard, you know, consumer grade, uh, uh, CMOS detector based imaging, you know, cameras. And, uh, th these, by the way, were superior to the things that had been used previously just because of the evolution of the technology. So something that a, that a consumer could get their hands on, you know, in that time frame, you know, the 2017, uh, time frame, um, was as good or better than the old CCD technology that had been used uh, during the NITS and Bass era. And so Thomas put those things out there and immediately we started seeing uh, very strange things happening, interference with the equipment. I won't take us too down too far down that rabbit hole unless you guys are interested in it. But but what we've done is, is take an approach that is, as I like to say, led by the data. When we see things happening in the environment that warrant 
uh, the deployment of more resources, the, the addition of, of, of more sophisticated equipment, we go ahead and commit to that. So we have expanded the network infrastructure, you know, to include things like uh, fiber optic or uh, Ethernet over coax or, or, or Wi-Fi, you know, mesh technology so that we can put sensors out in the field. You know, my very first test platform was whimsically named Satan. Um, <laughs> and some people smile at that. That was a that was a nod to really to Brandon's uh, often dark sense of humor. It meant sentinel assignment to entry and notification. It was basically a, a system that, that I put together to, modif uh, to uh, monitor and make us aware of seismic and infrasonic, uh, as well as electromagnetic signals, uh, you know, remotely. And we've just built, you know, we've gone well beyond that, that scope to include things such as we've talked about, including radiation detectors, uh, very sophisticated RF spectrum analyzers, you name it. And so it, it's just, it, it has grown and is continuing to grow. Great. And CJ, we have a listener question concerning scientific investigation and research for Eric and Thomas. We're speaking with Eric Bard and Thomas Winterton from the Secret of Skinwalker Ranch. And listener Jason Stifler wants to know, are the radiation spikes and magnetic anomalies occurring at the same time? That's a that's a really great question because you know I think all of us instinctively know that the name of the game has to at least be uh, to start with looking for correlations. You know we have a mantra out here that correlation is not causation, but for goodness sakes, let's see what changes with what. Do we see magnetic transients when we see the radiation spikes? Now the answer is no. Uh, there isn't a, there is no strong correlation between uh, magnetic events and and specifically, uh, uh, say, gamma radiation. Uh, we haven't detected that. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It's just that it has not shown up in the data. Um, but what we have seen that is, I, I, think, uh, I think, relevant to the question, we have seen magnetic transients when we get something showing up in those, um, those RF-sensitive devices, very low-frequency uh, sensitive devices that we carry around including things like tri-field meters. All right, Tim, did you have another question there? Yes, I did. Eric and Thomas, have you had any unexpected findings in your research, things that just blew your mind? I'd like Thomas to speak to the question of the unexpected first. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, I, I'm going to stay in my lane here. You know, I'm, I'm in charge of facilities and logistics. I really try to leave the science to, uh, to the guy, to the smart guys with the degrees right there. And I'll tell you, uh, for me, any unexplained finding is when I look at Eric and I see the baffled look on his face, I know that what we're witnessing is something uh, phenomenal, even though I may not even understand what it is. So I really looked at those guys and I have to say, you know, I've, I've personally had experiences and witnessed a lot of things that, that I myself cannot explain. Um, and, uh, and many days leave me feeling like I'm losing my grasp on reality. Mm. Um, that I have to say that I, I lean heavy on the team because there's many days where I feel like I'm starting to lose it. And it's nice to have these guys to, to, ground me and and to be able to validate that i'm not i'm not going crazy that that what we're experiencing is real even if it's unexplained but i'm just going to say for me uh any of those uh unexpected discoveries i i, I look at these guys and, and when i see eric scratching his head trying to figure it out i know i know it's unexpected from from what i've seen the way the uh, the series has been cut they're always cutting to me with a confused <laughs> look on my face. Sure, so you sure would get the impression that what Thomas said is basically always the case. It does seem that <laughs> we way. We always yeah. have something anomalous going on or something yeah. unexpected. But, you know, I, there are two points here. Number one, I am convinced, based upon my experience, that there is no degree program in the world that prepares a person to deal with the type of anomalous phenomenology that we see here. So, you know, I like to remind everyone that we are all natural born scientists at some level. You know, we have the tools within us, you know, just as as observers uh, yeah, to, uh, to to take the data, be led by the data. Um, you know, as long as we 
as long as we don't bring a strong, let's say, a confirmation bias, a belief system, or for that matter, science as a disbelief system into the picture, you know, it doesn't really matter what your background is. Um, I have I have been uh, really schooled, I'll say, you know, and I, and, and I, I feel no shame saying this. I am determined to be caught in the act of learning and very often at the hand of, of Thomas, uh, Bryant, Caleb, you know, people are, are noticing things that I I may have missed completely in my own data. And that has happened on more than one occasion. Now, as far as really unusual things happening, goodness, you know, we can point to any of the episodes that we've uh, um, aired and we'll find within those things that we did not expect. For example, Thomas, you know, I, I would ask, Tom, did you expect that bulldozer to stop working, you know, when we were uh, doing that excavation exercise? No, and th that whole circumstance from the time that bulldozer pulled onto the property uh, to the, I mean, it was, there was a whole set sequence of events that happened before that bulldozer even got on f camera. Uh, we, we fought and fought to, to get that bulldozer uh, batteries. Batteries kept, we drained, I think, 12 batteries in under an hour. And, and anyone that knows, understands heavy equipment, we're talking about the big industrial grade batteries put in a brand new set to bring the dozer out the next morning, got it there, batteries went dead, took batteries out, took them in, I think the Napa, got new set, came back, those went dead. They finally went back and that, and whatever parts store they were getting these batteries from said, we don't know what you're doing, but this is the last set we're warranting. So we, we had a lot of strange occurrences leading up to that. And then of course, what the viewers saw in the episodes. Yeah, I, I didn't expect any of that. Hmm. Yeah, you were you were you were barely cutting. You know, there was it was a very shallow cut that you were making. That should not have caused that bulldozer to to, to bog down the way it did. And and you know, so so the unexpected takes on many forms. And you know, I guess one of the one of the uh, outcomes that I I that I think really caught us all all off guard uh, was what what we all saw happen when we invited the uh, the astronomers out uh, to the ranch. I mean. Goodness, that's as, that's about as strange as it gets. Um, you know, it was a very well-defined uh, experiment. We were going to watch specific stars as they pass through a region of the sky as viewed from the helipad. And, you know, this is a perfect example of a clearly stated, testable, falsifiable hypothesis. We're going to see what's going to happen with the starlight as it passes through what we've been referring to as the anomaly. And what happens? You know, our attentive, our attentive focus is on that experiment, and we see something that is classically impossible taking place, which is the selective removal of the specific stars from the closed system guidance computer on those telescopes, <sighs> just as the stars were about to enter into that region of, of, uh, of the sky. How do you explain that? You know, of course, of course I had a confused look on my face. <laughs> so that, that's yeah. awesome. So that really leads me. Eric, directly into this question for you. And data and data collection has been a big part of our show, but also on the flip side, we, we have to deal with very speculative aspects of the paranormal. And I'm so interested to know how both of you deal with the need for scientific rigor and what you are trained in, in terms of the scientific method and the, with the more speculative aspects of what this investigation entails, how do you balance those two things? You know, you heard me say earlier something about there not being a degree program in the world that could prepare uh, an individual to deal with all of the phenomenology here. That's not at all to say that we don't rely heavily on the tools and methods and best practices of, of science. In my case, you know, we're heavy on physics. Um, one, one, one of the real challenges we're facing here, as I would assume all the viewership have picked up on, is that we are dealing very often with one-off phenomena, uh, meaning we don't have the benefit of statistics. We don't have statistical significance. We have singular events, very often events that are coming, you know, essentially coming out of our blind spot. Um, I don't want, you know, I don't celebrate that, but I have to admit it. You know, um, it's, I'm not giving us a pass when it comes to rigor just because our, our equipment is malfunctioning as often as it is. But I think what's happening is it's, is it's telling us perhaps we should be refocusing our efforts and, um, you know, casting a broader net. 
uh, than, than, than may originally be our, in, our, in our design. You know, we set out to do an experiment. And as I said, very often the results are perpendicular to, to what we intended to study. Um, fortunately, we do have, uh, you know, an ongoing monitoring. Uh, you know, we have uh, both the, the, you know, the, the video and the audio channels that are going out. In fact, uh, we have people around the world able to come in and, and actually help us to keep the vigil, watch what is happening on the property since so much of what has been reported has been of a visible nature, you know, visual. Um, and then of course we also have our data acquisition, you know, ongoing uh, with platforms like the ones that I've talked about. You know, what's so incredible is that for years now, there's been this stigma with UFOs, UAPs that, well, if there are so many of these happening, how come there's no pictures? How come there's no video? Everybody's got phones now. Right. And that's the one thing with your show. I mean, <laughs> The things you guys have seen, unless you are just completely dramatizing everything, and it's all fake, which I really don't believe. I truly believe that what we are seeing on this show, you guys are seeing on the ranch. I mean, th that is proof to me that there is something going on. So how do you now deal with all of us wanting to know? Like, get, tell me, tell me what is happening, what is in that mountain, what is happening in the sky, and still trying to, um, you know, honor honor the show, honor your work, honor your contracts, whatever it may be. Well, Thomas has a, I, I would say that Thomas has a much greater exposure to that kind of questioning and scrutiny than I have by the simple virtue of the fact that I don't have much of a social media presence at all. And that's, that's by design. You know, I, yeah. I try to stay out of all of that, but I know that Thomas has shared with me that he's fielded a lot. He's received a lot of inquiries uh, through those channels. Uh, you know, so Tom, you might be better able to speak to this question than I can. Well, it, it's definitely been an adjustment and, and there's part of it that I really enjoy. And then there's part of it that's, that's taken some getting used to. I mean, my, my wife and qu kids have quit sending me to the store. If we need a, you know, if we need a gallon of milk real quick, I'm not allowed to go get it because, <laughs> um, without fail, somebody in the store will stop me and want to share an experience that they had, or, or they have a question, you know, pertaining to the show. Um, I've been, I've been surprised, you know, I live there in the basin and I think that's probably been the thing that surprised me the most is over the past, uh, really since the show's come out. So in the last what four years, um, the amount of people, that have had experiences, some of them very profound and very um, impactful experiences that have occurred there in the Una Basin to them, that up till now, they never felt safe enough to share. And, and most of them, uh, probably 95% of them all start out with, hey, I got to tell you something that happened. But if you tell anybody I said this, I'm going to call you a liar because they don't, they don't want to be labeled as crazy. They don't want to be labeled. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard there's an individual that lives, uh, fairly close proximity to the ranch that was chased by a UFO. The, the story he relayed to me was that he was chased. Him and his dad were out irrigating a field late at night and actually had a craft that came down out of the sky and chased them. And they had to literally jump in the irrigation ditch and swim into the culvert and hide in the culvert for, uh, I believe he was, he said they were in there for like an hour before the craft left. So we're talking dramatic things. And, and I've been, most surprised by the sheer volume and number of these and they're coming from very credible people in the community grounded you know leaders civic leaders uh ecclesiastical leaders and so that's been surprising and and it's been it's been definitely an adjustment to go i, I mean i'm i'm in mississippi today and i'm i'm still getting fielding questions you know i'm still fielding questions from uh, from people about the show. So everywhere you go, it, it, it definitely takes more time to, to get there and do what it is you're trying to do. Well, uh, I recognize you even without the hat, huh? <laughs> no, I, I didn't. I knew this podcast was coming up and I, I, I thought about bringing the hat just for the podcast, but it's <laughs> it on the plane and not get it's it a big hat. that I, I, uh, yeah. I left at home and settled for an easy baseball cap. This might be a loaded question, but have, have your personal beliefs or your spiritual perspectives been affected by uh, your experiences on Skinwalker Ranch? Yes. How, how so? You just 
I mean, if you don't answer that, that's fine. That's no, it's a fair question. I, I don't yeah. mind you ask the question. I, to be honest, I don't know how to answer it really other than to say that um, my belief system in everything has had to evolve and update since I've been on the ranch. There's, I've experienced things. I've witnessed things. I've seen things that you can't unsee. You can't unwitness. And, and it really leaves you question, at least me questioning, you know, how it all fits together. And, and I still consider myself very spiritual, but I will say that my religious beliefs and, and that have definitely evolved a lot over the past few years. I think we kind of, that's kind of a norm we found with most of our guests that the experiences they've had paranormally have changed their outlook in that particular area a lot of the times. I think that's, that's pretty much common with most people that's experienced these things. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. And same thing with hosting this podcast. Like you said, you've had people, I've had people that I have known forever that once I started this podcast, started reaching out to me and going, okay, do you really talk about UFOs? Do you really talk about Bigfoot? Do you really talk about these things? And then they'll share their story with me. So my perspective has completely changed too. And that's one of the reasons I'm not kidding. I have been binge watched your show over the past couple of weeks and I've lost so much sleep because my mind has just had to shift so much with with the things that you guys are discovering. You know, once the show is done, once you're done recording, you know, what do you guys hope to discover as you continue your research on Skinwalker Ranch? Well, you know, I I had some thoughts as I as I was listening to Thomas's answer concerning uh, beliefs. Yes. And I, I think I'll start from there. Yes. And, and move into your question. You know, it. I'm I'm searching for a graceful way to to address that really important question uh, about um, how we engage with the unknown, and I guess the experience has for me uh, driven home the idea that perhaps the beginnings of spirituality are honesty with the self. You know, it's 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 very humbling to have to actually take inventory and say, what do I really know? What do I think? And how do I know? Why do I think what I think? You know, and the term that I often use is epistemic humility. Uh, you know, it's kind of a fancy um, pair of words, but quite useful and quite relevant here. And that is, you know, do we do 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 we uh, perhaps draw the lines uh, between the data points in a way that is counterproductive? Sometimes we're tempted to do that. I do that. I think we all do. You know, I have an expression that I use. I say sometimes we end up. Um, creating constellations of facts where the facts themselves are like the stars in that constellation. We draw those connective lines because it helps us to get our minds around it. And, and so that leads into my answer to the question, you know, we have facts. We have these one-off events that I've described. We have these data points. And so I think it would be fair to say for all of us that what we're hoping to do is to um, connect those facts in the most truthful way, you know, not just create um, artwork that suits us, not just draw any constellation that we can from them, but to actually find the real underlying connectivity between all these things that are happening. Uh, you know, I guess for me, it'd be summarized in fewer words. I'm looking for an explanation that has what we call unifying appeal, if possible, to find one cause uh, that could give rise to all of the many different things that we see, because they sure do seem different. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Albert Einstein would be so proud of that answer. <laughs> so, and, and you're right. one thing that that united them all. They are they are so different. I mean, you've got the the skinwalker, then you have the UAPs, then you have the radiation. So there's there's so many things going on. It's it's amazing. I tell you what really stunned me was the helicopter and, and the UAP flying underneath. It was visible. Mm -hmm. You could see that the UAP was underneath. And if I'm not mistaken, then the instrumentation of the helicopter kind of go crazy during that. And I mean, to see that pass underneath there, I was just shocked. I mean, that was one of the episodes that shocked me. You and me both. I was genuinely <laughs> nervous, and I think you could hear it in my commentary on yeah. the helicopter when you're talking about when that uh, 
uh, ground collision avoidance system was signaling that we had something um, 45 you know, as close feet. as 39, 40 feet below the helicopter yeah. when, when we were at, four, you know, 4,600 to 4,800 feet above the ground. You know, I think, I think they caught me saying, what the hell is under us? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, that's all very real. Um, you know, I was, I was concerned, you know, we were feeling, there was a lot going on there in, in, in what you see. And, you know, we were feeling that vibration. Cameron talked about the, the, uh, the buffeting, the vorticity, the rotation in the, in the air. There, it was very much as if we were not up there alone. And that's the kind of thing where, you know, when you're at nearly 5,000 feet above ground level, that starts to matter. Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. For me, it's the UFOs. They're UAPs that just disappear, like they're going into a portal of some sort. You see them and then whoosh, they're just gone. I really want it to be a portal. But um, <laughs> okay, Tim, did you have a question? <laughs> yes, I just wanted to close out with the scientific investigation and research portion of this show by uh, first a listener comment here. And it's a perfect segue to my question for you guys. And so... <laughs> I just got to kick out of this. Tom Akers says, I really hope we, this reminds me of the main tweets segments you see online, by the way, sometimes. <laughs> I really hope we get some kind of answers this season because I don't want this show to turn into that Oak Island show where it always is close, but nothing comes out of it. So I just <laughs> I got, I got, I got a I, kick look, out of I that. I promise no coconut fiber. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought that was a perfect segue to close out the scientific part of this show with this question. Guys, what do you hope to achieve with the ongoing scientific investigation of Skinwalker Ranch? You know, I think we've, we, we've kind of touched on this. Um, what do we hope to achieve? Um, you know, it isn't just a craven desire for closure, right? It isn't just that we want to close up all these open questions. There are two deliverables here. Yes, there are the answers. And I mentioned, you know, that, that my favorite kind of answer, you know, as, as principal investigator, obviously, I would like to find the answer that unifies all these disparate, very different things that are happening. You know, how do you how do you reconcile that you've got so many different things mm -hmm. happening on, on this on this one relatively small patch of land here in the at the low point of the Uinta Basin? Right. How, you know, how do you what can we find a unifying uh, explanation? So that's one deliverable. The other deliverable is is the elevation of the discourse itself and that is you know look at how we have historically engaged these topics you know there's been an awful lot of sensational stuff out there you know i don't want to disparage anyone but there are uh some people myself included who would look at at the genre as being maybe um a little unsavory because of the way it has been uh, handled and and again this is not at all to disparage the efforts of those who have been truly you know sincere investigators but there's been an awful lot of, of, of confirmation bias. There's been an awful lot of storytelling, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the deliverables, one of the things I hope to have come out of the investigation is that we will have elevated the way we engage, elevate the discourse. I really hope that means something to, to you guys and to those who are listening. Absolutely. Definitely. <laughs> and I have to oh, say, I'm I like I said, I'm a big Albert Einstein fan, fan and he – tried to have an equation or discover the equation to unify everything, all of physics, all of astrophysics. He ran into a little bit of trouble with quantum physics, but on this show, you know, we've experienced a wide swath of paranormal situations. And it's interesting. We can detect that there is some sort of common thread. We can't put our finger on it but it's there. So I applaud your search for that. So we touched a little bit on, you know, the interplay of science and beliefs as well. And I wanted to bring up something that um, I didn't really think of as I was watching the show until you had uh, a Native American gentleman come on. And I believe he was from the Ute tribe. Is that accurate? And he really cautioned you guys about messing with the land and said some prayers and said, you guys should be the ones saying the prayers. You're the ones that are about to, to mess with this land. And when we posted that we were going to do this show with you, somebody had commented a not very nice comment about, you know, how wrong it is to mess with, with Native American land. 
to, to tamper with this, to tamper with what might have happened before. And again, that wasn't something that I had thought of before this, but I figure since it came up, it's worth bringing up. How do you guys balance an approach that the ethics of the investigation with potentially dangerous things and, and interfering with potentially spiritual things? Well, I'll, I'll start by just kind of the, the public relations portion of, of, you know, the the ranch lies there in the middle of the Ute tribe reservation. Uh, they're our neighbors and uh, we appreciate, you know, the many, the many good things that they, they bring to the table. And I know that as we've done this investigation, the thing that I appreciate uh, a lot about Eric uh, and, and the, the science approaches that they've taken is that uh, they're open-minded. You know, they don't automatically dismiss anything. Uh, Eric always, Eric is always saying, I'm not here to believe. I'm not here to disbelieve. I'm here to observe. And so we inherited this this legend of the skinwalker this native american culture that we're right in the middle of and and it's something that we we do need to be sensitive of and it's something that we've taken very seriously um one of the reasons why brandon sent jim morse out before anybody is that jim morse has has a lifetime has spent his entire lifetime uh serving the native american communities he's helped raise millions of dollars for their scholarships he's um i mean he has great and very deep relationships within native american tribes um multiple and so jim has done a great job of outreaching to the the native americans in the area and you know it's interesting in the fact that um you know the legend of skinwalker is is that the the um tribe the Ute tribe provided scouts and assisted the the U.S. soldiers in pushing out the Navajos from the area. And the, originally, that the, where the ranch is was Navajo hunting ground, and that the Navajo shaman cursed the ground uh, because of that. And so, in in I know in conversations that I've been with Jim in with uh, Native Americans, there's been a pretty even split even among the tribal members there as to whether or not that's even real. We've had half of them that say, Oh, that's, you know, that's ridiculous. And the other half, I mean, there's some that have told us that when they drive down the main road, you know, to the East of the ranch, they will look towards the East, which is the opposite direction of the ranch. They refuse <laughs> to acknowledge it. Um, yeah. And so it's interesting to see, that even within the tribe itself, there's a there's a division in how to approach this. And so I think um, that all we can do where, where they're not even united themselves in in what's going on. Um, we just have to be open minded and, and we always want to just be culturally sensitive. And we've reached out to them many, many times on many different issues to get their take and to get their opinion on what they think might be happening and so we definitely view them as a as a wonderful asset to to lean on in some of these instances where we're coming across some of these discoveries, like for example, the petroglyphs that we found there on the ranch. Uh, you know, those that's something that we obviously lean into them and, and want to get their take. So, Is that you know, we, our approach is one that absolutely embraces uh, our. Native American, our tribal neighbors and friends, uh, we fully expect that we, we have a lot yet to learn uh, from their tradition. Um, you know, I've said it from the from the outset. Well, there are two things I've said. Uh, I remember I remember the first first day of filming, I kind of threw a fit and I said, <laughs> this is not just a science experiment, you know. Uh, you probably remember that, Tom. I was I was kind of <laughs> I, was, I was concerned that we were going in that direction. I said, this is not a science exercise to the exclusion of all else. And the other thing that I say is I can never allow this investigation to become uh, to become or to become perceived as a proposition of my science versus your tradition. Never. I want nothing to do with that. Uh, and in fact, anything that I can can learn 
uh, from the tradition, from the Native American tradition, I consider to be very valuable. And in fact, I've you know committed quite some time to searching out and, and reading available material and we'll probably read much more uh, as opportunity uh, presents. Yes, and maybe we'll find out that our science and their tradition go hand in hand. Love it. I love that. Yeah, yeah. All right, Tim, I know we've got some big questions that we want to dive into while we've got these two here with us. Is there anything that you wanted to ask before we move into some of these bigger, these big names? Yeah, so you mean before we get into hot takes? Mm hmm Yes, I do. So, uh, you know, we got season four of the Secret of Skinwalker Ranch coming up here in about a week. What do you guys see as the next steps for investigating the phenomenon at Skinwalker Ranch? We've got a giant metallic ab object in the mountain. We've got you know, drones, military crafts flying over the property. What what do you guys see as the next steps here? We, you know, I'll start with, with your introductory statement, and then I want to hear what Tom has to say, honestly. <laughs> um, uh, I feel like I'm talking too much. No, you're not. You're doing great. <laughs> okay. Well, we have... We, again, this goes back to something I was saying earlier about, you know, what do we really know? We know that we have retrieved metallic uh, specimens from a portion of the Mesa, right? We know that uh, we have uh, retrieved uh, not just metal, but uh, some material that incorporates some really interesting metals. And perhaps, according to some who've looked at this, we, we might be looking at a metamaterial of some kind, you know, something that is perhaps... Uh, made in a, uh, I think it was described as being made in a blast furnace uh, compared to materials used in the aerospace industry. We don't know uh, what those are, uh, but the fact is we don't know at this point that we have a large metallic object in the Mesa. What we know is that we've retrieved metal from our, uh, really what is a biopsy uh, at this point, going into the, to the base of the Mesa, and we know that we have encountered uh, something that was not permitting that that directional drilling uh, uh, drill head to to go upwards as intended, but was actually driving it down, and then eventually uh, it was able to come upwards. Um, so we've encountered something very hard, is what I read into that. Yeah, and I mean, you know, looking forward, I, I guess from where you guys are sitting right now, with with you know you all you know is what you've seen on up to season three. Uh, we have the benefit of having film season four last summer. And, uh, and I'll just say, you know, season four was a roller coaster. Unlike anything I've ever ridden before. Um, uh, I, I want, I'm sitting here watching the teaser that you guys played at the beginning of, of this uh, interview and just watching that, uh, I'm flooded with all kinds of emotions that I felt when we were in the process of filming. I have to say that I caught myself holding my breath through some of those imageries just because of the uh, almost like a PTSD in a way. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still trying to process uh, the events that happened during season four. I think now I haven't had the privilege of being able to see the episodes Uh yeah, um, you know, we, we, we film all summer and then it's always fun to see how the editors put it together and, and put the storyline together out of it. But um, I'm, I'm really excited to share, you know, knowing what we captured and not having seen the episodes. I'm not sure how to play out yet, but I'll tell you that season four was incredibly um eye-opening and, and it, like say I'm still processing and you can imagine based on the things you guys said you know the metal that we pulled out of the mesa uh the the occurrences that have happened there at the triangle in season three so you can only imagine that going into season four uh well I mean you can see tell by the teaser where some of our focus is and and I just say it, it's going to be a incredible journey these next 14 weeks as these episodes air imagine how we feel 
You lived it. We have to wait to watch it on TV. <laughs> yeah. You know what's going to happen. <laughs> the suspense. Yeah, the suspense. Yeah. I'm right in line with you, Thomas. You know, I got to say, uh, you know, for the first three, uh, th first three years, first three seasons, you know, I just refused to watch it. You know, unless I had my arm twisted behind my back, you know, I just, I wouldn't do it. I, and, and as CJ said, you know, I, we've lived it. Well, I, I, my, my statement was, well, I lived it once and once is enough. Um, but um, I have taken the opportunity to look at some of the rough cut material for the purpose of providing a little bit of the scientific, uh, you know, and other, other feedback uh, on, on what has been uh, put together as prospective uh, um, episodes. And it is jarring. Sometimes I find myself uh, just, it, it, it's hard to believe that all of that happened, you know, in, in, in last summer and uh, early fall. It's just, what was your, what was your term, Tom? You said it was like PTSD. I think I can relate to that. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a great There's, way to describe it. So guys, this is a little sneak peek and a question I'm going to ask later, but are there any collaborations or partnerships? You know, there are a lot of big name groups out there studying the paranormal, in particular UFOs and UAPs. We've got NASA, we've got Aero, A A R O, we've got the Pentagon, we've got all kind of folks out there doing legitimate studies of paranormal activity, particularly UFOs and UAPs. Are there any collaborations or partnerships that you guys want to pursue or think that you should pursue for advancing the scientific understanding of the ranch? I, you know, I think without being preemptive of, of things uh, currently in, in motion, I would say to you, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Reason enough. The reason enough to watch. Um, uh, we were There's, given access to the first episode of season four, so we have seen it. So I'm not sure how much we're allowed to say or what is known. And, I don't, and we are live, so I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Just a little bit, I'd say. <laughs> but I'll let you go, Tim, because I don't want to be the one to get in trouble. You ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, Smitty, did you have something to throw in there? I was just going to ask, is there, there a season that seems to be more active for these paranormal activities than other seasons or is it pretty much you mean season the board? of the year yeah season like of the year. fall oh. summer spring i know thomas has a take on that well um you know what happens i i think we agree that we haven't been able to put a pattern to it as far as any type of predictable cycle or or uh you know predictability to it but I, I have observed, and, and maybe there's various reasons for it, but it does seem like maybe there's an uptick during the January, February part. Um, but, you know, I, I have to say, after filming season four, I mean, like Eric said, we captured, we had so many things happen in those couple short months that it'd be hard for me to say that anything in January, February has surpassed <laughs> what we yeah. captured in those couple months. So. Yeah. That's a, I, I don't know. What do you think, Eric? You know, uh, your your personal experiences and the things that I observed in the surveillance, you know, before we began the public facing work and with the documentary uh, align really well. You know, I saw a lot of things, you know, during the winter months. Right. Um, you know this. Uh, you know, we asked people who had lived, I, I've certainly asked people who have either lived on the ranch or, or, you know, in the area, what they thought about this very same question. And it was interesting because I would get diametrically opposed answers. I've had people tell me, mm -hmm. oh, the month of June or July, and others have said exactly what you said, Thomas, you know, February. Um, you know, the fact is, as Thomas mentioned, you know, we're engaging, you know, in a very different and a very, uh, I won't say aggressive, but proactive way when we're yeah. doing the documentary work. Um, and I like to think that it's synergistic with the, the more light handed uh, observational work that we do through the balance of the year. So we're seeing, we're seeing aspects of the ranch. We're seeing aspects of the phenomenology come forward. 
you know, when we engage with these, these sometimes very large scale and very ambitious and energetic experiments uh, that, that, that we see in the episodes, but then I, I, I have to say, I enjoy as much or more seeing what happens on its own, because think about it, you know, the, the inherited narrative is not one in which individuals going back into the, say the 1980s, 1990s and so forth, it's, it's not like they were conducting, uh, d- d- there were deliberate attempts to, to, to push the buttons and pull the levers and turn the knobs and elicit some kind of response as far as we know. These were things that happened on their own. And so those uh, have historically been the kinds of events that I've been most focused on, you know, in a more of an observational mode. And they are very interesting. We've caught a lot of stuff uh, just by keeping the vigil. Thank you. All right, Tim, let's jump into some of those hot takes real quick. All right, so hot takes, guys. So just um, I'm going to throw some things at you pretty quickly here and get really quick hot take answers. And um, I'm also going to revisit anything that we might have left behind here. But, you know, we had an astrophysicist on the show one time, and he said that he was asked if he discovered proof of alien life to let the president know first. He said, no, I will not do that. I will be (laughs) revealing that to the public and to academia at large. So, Eric and Thomas, you know, how do you balance the desire to share your findings with the public and academia with concerns about sensationalism or misinformation? That's not exactly a hot take, a little bit more of a longer question, but still. Short and sweet, I think it depends on the circumstance. It depends on exactly what is observed. Yeah, I think I think the information that you gather, uh, we all have a desire to be very transparent and open with what we're seeing. But if there was an instance where what we were witnessing could have, say, national security implications, then we have a responsibility. We, we can't be putting people at risk or putting you know, our desire for transparency over the, the safety concerns of many. So like Eric said, it would depend on exactly what it was that we, what we had. Great. Good answer. And I want to go over some listener comments and questions. I don't know who this group is, but they've been very active tonight on the show. Perhaps y'all have heard of them. The SWR insiders are addicted to the show. They've been really active. Skinwalker Ranch. I know. I assume that's the Skinwalker (laughs) Ranch insiders, but I I don't know about the Skinwalker Ranch insiders, but they're definitely here tonight. So I wanted to give them a shout out. Let's see. uh, Listener Kimberly Boyd wants to know, have you videotaped actual Skinwalkers? Well, before you move on, I just want to say, and I'm sure Eric does too, we we freaking love our Skinwalker Ranch insiders. And for those of you that don't know who they are, they are like an extension of our team. They watch vigilantly on our live stream day and night. And they are some of the they are a group of some of the coolest and, and smartest individuals that, that you'll find. So we we absolutely love our insiders. I just asked him the other day. I was like, "Do you wonder? If, do you think they have a live stream? <laughs> I Dude. want to check it out." Yes, I'm joining. I'm joining. Y- yes, we do. And I got to tell you, it has really uh, yielded dividends. Uh, just exactly as I hoped it would. The first time I, I floated the idea to Brandon, you know, goodness, it was it was 2017. You know, I said, "Yeah, we've got to get this in front of more human observers." And I don't want to take too much time on this because I know this wasn't your question, but goodness. Uh, we've had people observing things. We're talking about single frame events, like a 30th of a uh-huh. second events that are actually quite interesting to us. And that's recently. We've had people notice things that are very subtle, very slow to develop, you know, and, and it's remarkable how uh, human beings have such a capacity for, for detecting very nuanced changes in the environment and things in that, in that uh, uh, visible and audible uh, data stream that we're that we're uh, sending out, and so that has been exactly as hoped a very valuable research tool. And I consider these our colleagues at large. Brilliant! That was a brilliant plan, and I, I'm joining. <laughs> okay, on with the question. Sorry, I just uh, I had no I had worry. To, yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we're getting hit up, blown up here by Skinwalker Ranch insiders. It's, it's amazing. So. Have you videotaped, let's just say, not just skinwalkers, skinwalkers, 
any other curiosities on videotape? Uh, I'll speak to that. Um, I have not seen anything in our video record that, that uh, corresponds to the, the traditional description of a skinwalker, which is like a some sort of an upright humanoid, maybe part, I, I hope I don't say this wrong, something like a, a human being that's also got animal qualities. I have not uh, seen anything like that in uh, the video uh, record. Um, there, there have been some, some animals show up that uh, I didn't expect to see. Uh, an example, you know, I didn't know that there were wolves out here. Mm. And, and I have, in fact, seen not just the coyote, but there have been a few instances of actual wolves. Crazy. Oh, cool. Have there been any alien abductions from the ranch that you know of? This comes from listener Kimberly S. Boyd. Yeah, so the trespassers that come on the ranch that are never heard from again, we write <laughs> all those off as <laughs> That makes sense, and it really right. leads right into our next question. Are you guys afraid of alien abduction yourself? No. I don't know how to answer that. Um, you know, I think it's true of both Thomas and myself that when we go out in the field, we are checking the horizon all the time. We're checking the skies above. We're looking over our shoulders. You know, it isn't just the alien uh, theme or meme or whatever you want to call it. It isn't just aliens uh, that uh, that concern us, um, although that is within the scope. Uh, I don't think it's specifically that that would that would inspire fear in me. Yeah, right. I'm more I'm more fearful of the human type abduction. Uh, you know, we we unfortunately because of the spotlight that's been put on the ranch, we've we've been subject to threats or people that you know people that think that we're aliens and are going to come out and quote bag them an alien. We're we're I'm more way more concerned about the the human type than I am of uh, anything extraterrestrial. So mm -hmm. good, that's unfortunate. So I want to th say thanks to all the listeners tonight and thanks to Eric Bard and Thomas Winter Winterton from the Secret Skinwalker Ranch for coming on with us tonight. And now, guys, for some real quick, real action, live action, hot takes. Eric and Thomas, Robert Bigelow. More specifically, did he take anything <laughs> from the ranch or leave anything at the ranch? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Very mysterious, a secretive guy, in my opinion. I don't. I honestly don't think that I could say one way or another whether he did or didn't. I can tell you from speaking with him that he takes this problem set very seriously. Definitely. All right, guys. What's your hot take on one Travis Taylor? <laughs> 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 awkward i'm waiting for eric to go first and i'll finish up um what can i say i you know i'm thrilled that he's part of our team he i'm grateful i'm, I'm grateful to uh travis for being a co-witness he and i and and thomas and sometimes the entire group are seeing things together that without travis there as a witness I, I don't know that I would be as comfortable engaging what we've seen and heard and measured. So, yeah, of course, thrilled to have him on the team. There's a perfect example of my views evolving 180 degrees. I thought he was a complete pompous, arrogant guy beginning, and he proved me to be the exact opposite. He's actually, he's a wonderful human being. I consider him a very close friend. I, I, I have a lot of uh, love and respect for Travis. And uh, like Eric said, um, you know, he brings a lot to the table for us as a team. And, and I can't imagine doing it without him. Good answer. So I'm not going to give anything away, but there was some public knowledge events that happened between season three and season four with Travis Taylor. Hopefully it won't cause too much drama for season four. Guys, what's your hot take on Brandon Fugel, current ranch owner. 
don't know if I want to touch this one. This is really complex. Be careful. Um, yeah, Tim, Tim is just asking these questions in a very dramatic way, which is, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> there's only one Brandon Fugel. Amen. <laughs> What's your take on your balls, Tim? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's next episode. You know, I, will, I will say real quick, I appreciate Brandon's desire for transparency. I mean, uh, Brandon could have chose to take Bigelow's route and keep all this secret, keep it to himself. Right. And, uh, and you know, Brandon didn't come in this for with the intent of a TV show. For two years, I fielded phone calls from producers because I was the only publicly associated name with the ranch when Brandon first bought it. I fielded dozens of calls from producers and networks wanting to do a show, I would pass the message on to Brandon and he would always respond with two words, not interested, not interested. Mm -hmm. And even the show today, that is a result of an individual and I'll give him full credit. TJ Allard called, called me like clockwork every month. The guy was tenacious. Oh, yeah. He was persistent. He was a gentleman and, and very professional and it was through his persistence that he finally got an audience with Brandon after almost a year. So Brandon didn't jump into this and say, oh, I want to be famous. I want a TV show. He was basically drugged to the party. But I appreciate Brandon's willingness to be transparent. And I, and I appreciate his curiosity and his uh, putting, you know, really putting his personal dollars towards trying to get answers for that benefit us all. So I will say. Brandon seems to have, based on our research, a sense of humor, perhaps a hidden sense of humor. We notice he purchased Skinwalker Ranch with a holding company by the name of Adamantium Holdings. <laughs> <laughs> and Mantium being the most, the strongest metal in the universe, according to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that is. Well, look, I, I, I realize it's it's a it's a closely guarded secret, but Brandon is actually quite a fan of pop culture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I said, there's only one Brandon Fugel. Yeah, that's great. great. All right, guys, just a couple more here. Not too far from Skinwalker Ranch sits Roswell, New Mexico. What's your hot take on Roswell? Goodness, I... I have no idea. That's that's out of my uh, out of my field of view at this point. Who knows? Maybe it'll come it'll come in, in into scope. But as it stands, I don't think I should say anything about Roswell. Yeah, I know this is horrible because of the space that I'm in. But I know so little about it that I'm very uninformed. I, I couldn't make an intelligent comment about it. Well, I feel like we should all meet up at. Skinwalker Ranch sometime and take a little road trip down to Roswell. And while we're at it, <laughs> guys, I would love your hot take on another popular road trip attraction not too far from Skinwalker Ranch, Area 51. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, 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 like, I like the idea of, of, of uh, not locking horns uh, with the folks behind the signs that say no trespassing <laughs> and uh, lethal force use of lethal force has been uh, authorized. So I don't know what you mean by a trip to area. 51. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean that ridge like 10 miles outside the property. Sure. <laughs> sure. sure. I mean, look, the curiosity is always there, you know, but this is, this is one of the things I, I often say curiosity alone is not an entitlement to answers. Uh, you know, and so I say that on my own behalf. I, you know, I, I'm not speaking for anyone else, but my curiosity alone does not entitle me to answers. Certainly, I'm interested in what happens there, but I recognize the need for, you know, perhaps the uh, the, the protection of things in, in the interest of national security there. Well, and I, I'll just also throw out a little uh, fact that probably not very many people know, and I, I feel comfortable sharing this because I've heard him share this publicly. But our own Jim Morse has been inside Area 51 with uh, Representative Jake Garn. So uh, Jim has been to fit, not just to it, but in into. So that's like and his number is. <laughs> and now getting him to talk about anything that was there, he won't do. But he can, oh. he can acknowledge that he's been oh. there. 
Have you That's seen Jim and Bob Lazar having breakfast or anything like that? <laughs> Jim Morris will have breakfast with anyone. So even if you're <laughs> much. That's a fact. Jim is one of the greatest guys you'll ever meet. What do we call him, Tom? <laughs> what, what, which we, refer, we, we refer to Uncle Jim as the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> guy that's the most interesting guy. That's fun. Yeah. All right, CJ, I'm going to throw it back over to you guys. Thanks so much for humoring me with hot takes. Hey, I just have one more. And this one, I feel like be because I have this opportunity to ask you guys, I need to. This 1.6 gigahertz radio frequency yes. that's happening. Can you further explain that to me, somebody that does not have knowledge of radio frequency? It seems like every time you do something, this frequency is is occurring. I think What's I just saw that? Thomas scoot away from the table. <laughs> <laughs> this is out of my wheelhouse. This is a, uh -oh. this is a total area. Um, okay. Yes, I'll, I'll address this because this is, in fact, something that comes up very often. And, uh, you know, actually, I appreciate the question. It hadn't occurred to me that this might be worth talking about. But um, um, it is not the fact that we see, uh, you know, a peak in the in the spectrum uh, at or near 1.6 gigahertz. First of all, it isn't exactly 1.6 gigahertz. And it's and it's it, we, we, we fully understand that this is a region of the electromagnetic spectrum where we do have what we would call traffic, you know, or, you know, th there are things that operate in that space, things that we know about, including, you know, satellite communications and, and, and so forth. Um, what is interesting to us is when we see um, what I would call badly behaved signals that don't stay in their lane. So imagine you've got a series of, of well-defined peaks across a range of the, of the RF spectrum. You know, I, I typically stream uh, to the to the through the live stream a portion of that electromagnetic spectrum from 1.3 up to 1.9 gigahertz, and we see a regular pattern of uh, of signals that that occupy that space. But what we're looking for are those instances where we see a peak that that doesn't obey the conventional rules. It you know it's moving around. You know it's not staying in its lane. That's the sort of thing that gets our attention. There's another thing that happens in that region that's worth talking about. And that is when the entire noise floor, think of it as the low level static, if you will, when the entire noise floor jumps up as if it has been, you know, every frequency across that, that domain has suddenly been em emitted by something. Those are the kinds of events that interest us and quite frankly, concern us. What, what could be causing them? Y you know, I've, I've heard Travis exclaim, there's not a technology on earth that can do that. Um, you know, I wish he were here in this conversation because I'm sure he could add a lot to this. It was, in fact, you may remember uh, when when we were exploring one of these uh, cavities in the mesa. We, uh, we call it the swimmy headed hole. It's kind of like yeah. it's like a, yeah. a cave. Um, you know, we were exploring that and looking at uh, uh, an airflow that was seeming to come out of what may be a natural duct uh, in this opening. Uh, Travis experienced some symptoms, you know, he talked about being kind of lightheaded or as he says, swimming headed up there. And it was in that very same exercise, that same time frame, that uh, one of the uh, members, uh, visiting members of our team, it was a geologist, noticed that on a handheld spectrum analyzer, he was seeing, uh, you know, a very strong peak right in that range, that 1.6 gigahertz range. And I think that's what really turned our attention to this uh, um to this 1.6-ish gigahertz signal. And it kept coming up again and again and again in our, in our work. So I, I don't want people to get the impression that we are running around with our hair on fire because we see signals in that range. We know there are signals in that range. It's the particular character of those signals that interests us. And I'll tell you, um, from having watched the RF spectrum all the way down into the kilohertz range and up into the uh, you know six gigahertz and beyond, um, there are lots of places where I see signals that, are, that seem to be very strangely behaved, and I don't have a good uh, explanation for that behavior. Hmm. Wild. I'm, I'm just dying to know <laughs> what's causing it all. I know you guys are too. And Eric, you seem to definitely rely heavily on, I'm not going to jump to any conclusions until I have full answers. But Thomas, what do you think is buried under those rocks? <laughs> 
Are you talking about in the Mesa where we? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Boy, I uh, I'll tell you right now, I've I've spent a lot of time uh, focused on that area, and uh, without going into season four too much, uh, it's definitely there's definitely something worth investigating there. I mean, we, mm. we've got multiple data points that are pointing to that spot, so okay. that's that's all I'm gonna say. We'll have to watch, and I can't wait. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the comment earlier, but somebody came on here and said that they started studying astronomy because of you, which I think is a is a major tribute to the work that you're doing. And the work that you are doing goes so far beyond the show on the History Channel, but truly to so many things that are happening in the nation right now, just studying UAPs and trying to understand those bigger answers, you know, where did we come from, where are we going, and what else is happening that we can't see. For those that watch the show, for those that don't watch the show, for those that believe that don't believe, you know, what is one takeaway from what you have learned with your work at Skinwalker Ranch that you would want to share with people? I'm going to go first because Eric wraps everything up so nice in a little bow. I do not want to. <laughs> Deal. Um, I'll just say that the, the, the one takeaway that I have from the ranch is that there's obviously a lot more to this world than we, that, than meets the eye. There's a lot more than we understand. And I, I cringe at the word paranormal. I know the team does too, you know, paranormal to me is simply science that we don't yet understand it. It's, and, and so uh, coming on to the ranch with somewhat of a, well, very skeptical mind and maybe a closed mind. Uh, I think my takeaway is, is that there is a lot that goes on in this world that we still have yet to learn and understand. Uh, you know, I think, I think a takeaway for me, I could, I could name any number of them, but one takeaway for me is that the ranch itself and the investigation are really a stewardship. You know, we, we may or may not get what, what some will consider to be final answers, but you know, we will uh, definitely advance the discourse. We'll move the needle and, and then some. And so there's the stewardship of, of, of this property and of the data. There's the stewardship of the discourse. And, you know, it's just a privilege to be able to, uh, to touch the face of this problem um, and to work at the interface between the known and the unknown, really on the periphery of uh, canonical science. And uh, I'm just grateful to have the chance to do that with uh, what, for the most part, seem to be uh, the best wishes of those who are watching our work and now participating in it. Yes. Wonderful. And we are so lucky to have you guys with us here and to be doing the work that you're doing and to come and share it with us. Tim and Smitty, before we sign off for good, anything you guys had to add? Yeah, before I toss it to Smitty, just one final technical thing here, guys. If you could, after we go off there, just remain in the studio with us until your audio and video uploads. I meant to mention that earlier, and we appreciate that. Thank you. We well, just want to thank you for being with us. And if you're listening to us and you have not seen Unseen World of Skinwalker Ranch, you need to definitely get on the History Channel and watch it. It's addictive and and as I always say, be happy, be strange, and listen to all things unexplained. Good night. And we always leave it to Smitty to get the name of the show wrong. It's the secret of Skinwalker Ranch. Well, Check I'm that sorry. one out. I'm sorry. It says the unseen <laughs> thing. It says it at the top there. <laughs> and we're that hoping to have Eric show. and Thomas back <laughs> in the near future oh to talk about yes. Beyond Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. Okay. You know about that too. Absolutely. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I have oh. watched the show. I promise I'm a fan of it. It's been a long day. <laughs> Thanks, guys. As it has been. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. Thanks, guys. Good night, everybody. Good night.